like that song and I, I'm glad we got to play it again. Um, well, the last few weeks have been pretty eventful. Um, last Saturday we had Richard Gage and Ken Jenkins give presentations at Portland Community College. I was able to uh, video all of it and stay tuned for that probably in August by the time they, their system grinds through and kicks it out. But in the meantime, um, I'll let everybody know when we have it uploaded to YouTube and other resources so you can watch it. But we recorded it in high definition and Portland Community College gave me a plug into their audio board so we have perfect audio too. And that's kind of unusual for on the spot presentations, but we're in good shape that way. Now a lot of things have been happening on the, on the news. Um, one of the things that is right up there is the the, the backdoor approach that the Obama administration did has succeeded. Remember last year, Judge Forrest, Catherine Forrest, declared the indefinite detention part of the NDAA as unconstitutional and put a permanent injunction against it? Well, the Obama administration weaseled around the backdoor, 
and got a, uh, an appellate court, a, uh, another federal appeals court, to uh, overturn that permanent injunction. So the Obama administration seems to think that we need to violate the Constitution. We need to be the world's foremost torturer. We need to be the world's most foremost imprisoner. Boy, that's really bad <laughs> language. Sorry, I'm just thinking ahead. We, we need to be the worst of the worst. When I was growing up, we were told who the boogeyman was, and it was Russia and those dirty commies. And what, what did the dirty commies do that set them apart from us? Why, they would torture people. They would take people off the street with no charges and lock them up forever with no access to a lawyer, no access to their family, no access to visitors. Nobody even knows where they went. That's what those dirty commies did. But hey, I'm proud to say that America won't let those dirty commies have one up on us. We are now the world's foremost in all those categories. All right, something to be proud of, America. Well, of course, for those of you that are not quite astute enough, I'm being sarcastic. Uh, but l we're going to watch a video now, and let's take a look at how Ireland, at least one voice in Ireland, looks at the United States and Obama. Obama just visited Ireland, and, uh, well, we'll just take it from there. If you're ready in the, in the room there, go ahead and roll that one. All right. Um, Taoiseach, I think it's important to take this opportunity to bring a bit of balance into the discussions around the visit of the US President and his wife, given the almost unprecedented slobbering over them that the nation has been exposed to over the last number of days. And it's really hard to know which is worse, whether it's the outpourings of the Obamas themselves or the sycophantic fawning over them by sections of the media and the political establishment. We've had separate and special news bulletins by the state broadcaster to tell us what Michelle Obama and her daughters had for lunch in Dublin, but very little questioning of the fact that she was having lunch with Mr. Tax Exile himself. Uh, we had very little challenging of the fact that she's glad to be home, home a country that she's been in less than a week and that her husband has very tenuous links in. And of course, the biggest irony of all, the protestations of Obama himself in his speech to the children in Northern Ireland about peace. When he said, those who choose a path of peace, I promise you that the United States of America will support you every step of the way. We will be the wind at your back. Now I ask you, is this person going for the hypocrite of the century award? Because we have to call things by their right names. And the reality is that by any serious examination, this man is a war criminal. He has just announced his decision to supply arms to the Syrian opposition, including the jihadists, fueling the destabilization of that region and continuing to undermine secularism and knock back conditions for women. This is the man who is in essence stalling the Geneva peace talk by trying to broker enhanced leverage for the Syrian opposition by giving them arms and to hell with the thousands more who lose their lives or the tens of thousands more who will be displaced as this war goes on. This is the man who has facilitated a 200% increase in the use of drones which have killed thousands of people including hundreds of children. And you Taoiseach, you are the one who's turned a blind eye on these activities. You've talked about the G8 being an opportunity to showcase Ireland. But is it not a reality that you have showcased us as a nation of pimps prostituting ourselves in return for a pat on the head? To be honest with you, we were really speculating this morning whether you were going to deck the cabinet out in leprechaun hats decorated with a bit of stars and stripes to really really mark abject humiliation here. So my question to you, Taoiseach, is as follows. What steps are you going to take to follow in the correct statements and the correct decision 
of your colleague Tánaiste Eamon Gilmore, who voted against the lifting of the arms embargo in relation to Syria. What steps are you going to take to ensure that no weapons for Syria are going to go through Shannon in breach of our international laws Thank on you, neutrality? Lady. What steps are you going to take to showcase this country, not as a lapdog of US imperialism, but as an independent nation with an independent foreign policy, which takes a lead in international Deputy. diplomacy to outlaw the use of drones, the favourite method of extermination of your friend, Mr. Obama. On the Quite please. Well, let me, shh, let please. me confirm to you, first of all, that the President was not inquiring about your whereabouts or your well-being. I think your comments are disgraceful. I think they do down the pride of Irish people all over the world, who are more than happy to see this island um, be a host to the G8, the leaders of the most industrialised nations in the world. And for you, Deputy Daly, to stand up here and criticise the American president for giving a continuation of support for a fragile peace process in Northern Ireland, where over 3,000 people lost their lives over 30 years, is a disgraceful do-down. And if you, represent, if you represent those people on the back, on the back line over there, if that's the kind of comment that you intend to make, well, then it's, it's, be, it's beneath you, actually. Even, even those of your predecessors, in their, in their brilliance, never matched what you've just said here. Let me remind you, let me remind you that the communities in Northern Ireland and the politicians from administrations on this, uh, on the, in this house here, of all governments, together with British governments and Northern Ireland politicians and Northern Ireland communities, have put together a very fragile peace. And far be it from you to come in here and criticise somebody who wants to support that process visibly, personally, uh, and with assistance from the United States, where 35 million Irish Americans, Deputy Daly, want this peace process to continue. And the young lady, the young student, who introduced the president in Belfast, put her finger on it very well when she said, the reality is that Northern Ireland has had a past, and the reality is that Northern Ireland has a future. And that future, Deputy Daly, is one where peace in communities and across communities should abound. And it's beneath you to, um, to say that the American president uh, should not be a party to keeping that process alive and visible. Insofar as, insofar as the discussion on Syria is concerned, there was a serious discussion at the, uh, at the G8 summit with the members of the G8 themselves. Um, I'm not sure whether you favour uh, the Russian intervention here uh, or whether you favour what the European Union uh, put forward while there was division among the countries in Europe about the lifting of the arms embargo. Ireland took a very clear position on this, which was articulated by the Thánaiste, that the embargo should not be lifted. But the conclusion of the G8 summit was that the Geneva peace talks should take place. Nobody wants to see wanton slaughter and the exodus of hundreds of thousands of people from Syria. Um, and, and, and far from, far from, um, far from a warmongering um, discussion, the situation here is what can you do to bring about discussions and negotiations that will restore, in the first instance, uh, peace to this situation, and in the second instance, a structure that will allow Syria uh, to continue in the time ahead without the obscenities and the humanitarian crisis that we've witnessed in the last two years. Mark, Deputy Daly, one minute. So, please, please. Yeah. One minute, Deputy. Thanks, Kian yeah. Corla. Of Some course, minutes. I said nothing about the Northern Ireland peace process, a process which everybody supports, but is not one that gives you a license to do whatever you like anywhere else around the globe. There isn't much peace in Iraq, where 26 people lost their lives yesterday. There isn't much peace in Afghanistan. There isn't much peace in Pakistan. And there certainly isn't much peace in Syria. And the side I'm on in Syria is the one 
and I, what I agree with is the statement by Oxfam, where Ox, Oxfam said, sending arms to the Syrian opposition won't create a level playing field. Instead, it further risks fueling an arms free-for-all, where the victims are the civilians of Syria. Our experience tells us that the crisis will only drag on for longer if arms are poured in. And that's in essence what the Americans have done here. I can only take from your non-answer to the question that you were asked is that you're going to take no steps to ensure that those arms will not be sent through Shannon in breach of our neutrality. You said here last week no arms ever came through Shannon. How do you know that, seeing as no investigations take place? The reality is in 2012, 548 US planes landed in Shannon. How do you know what was on them if you haven't examined them? Your Minister for Transport revealed uh, in a parliamentary question that 239 civilian planes landed in Shannon where they sought permission because they were carrying munici munitions of war or dangerous goods on a civilian aircraft. What steps are you going to take to intervene in this situation? And the last point I'll make is that people in this country are very fond of our American brothers and sisters. And I think we stand far more shoulder to shoulder with them by making valid criticisms of their president who has broken his election promises rather than just pimping this nation as a tax haven for their corporations. I'm sure the Americans would far prefer if their multinationals paid their taxes at home rather than offshore here so they could develop their health care so they wouldn't be wasting money on arms being sent to slaughter people in other countries. Thank you, Deputy. The final reply is he shook. Yes. Would, wouldn't it be great if we had politicians like that? That's what you have witnessed, ladies and gentlemen, substance over politics. The gentleman that responded to her responded in exact, straight off the, the top of the, the list of what is the official policy, and it had no brains involved with it whatsoever. And then you get her up there saying that they love the American people, and they, they think that standing with the American people and, oh, you, well, you heard it yourself. It was so good. Oh, I just love it. But now we've all wanted to see Bush prosecuted for his war crimes, and I think it's going to happen. We're going to play a clip now that will explain that to you. But guess what? He's going after Obama for his war crimes, which are far more extensive than Bush's war crimes. Just remember that. You folks that voted for Obama, if you have any trust in him left, you're still being fooled. Think about this Trayvon Martin case before we go to this video. The Trayvon Martin case, Obama came out and he did a 20-minute, no teleprompter little speech talking about how Trayvon might have been his son, you know, and how it, a black man can't walk through a neighborhood and all that. All the stuff he said was absolutely right. He was true. He was right. But the underlying intrigue about this is that that is a cover-up for what he's doing behind the scenes. He's trying to promote violence and promote distrust in the court system. His behind-the-scenes actions influencing the judge so that the judge would not allow any of the, you know, racial uh, aspect of the case to come in. The judge denied all kinds of evidence that would have swayed the jury, and they set it up so that there was no way except to acquit the guy, and it was designed from the get-go to foment violence. And the Obama administration was right on top of that, too. It's been exposed. They've been spending their money to foment the violence. They've been spending their money to hire troublemakers and rioters at the same time talking out of the other side of their mouth about peace and love and brotherhood is necessary while sticking a wedge in it. Now a lot of you, I had an argument with one of our so-called alternative news sources here yesterday at Cable Access and I got shut down like I was a you know spanked like a what do they call it, a stepchild or whatever, because I wasn't saying something that she wanted to hear. She was telling me about how wonderful it was that Obama got off the teleprompter and started talking from his heart. And I was trying to tell her that that was a cover-up con job, even though it was true. She was mad because I would say such a thing. 
and she argued with me about what he was saying, and I said, I do not have a problem, I don't have any problem with what he said. Just the fact that he was using it as a political tool, and it wasn't true from his heart, it was simply a cover-up, and the whole thing is a distraction to keep you from thinking about Fast and Furious, where Obama himself was in, involved, not just Eric Holder and all the lower minions, and, you know, and, and the wiretapping and all these things, any one of which would have brought down the presidency 20, 40, 30, 50, 60 years ago, whatever. But not now. What has changed? It's apathy. Okay, well, let's go on into that video. I've talked too much. We'll go on into the video, and it, you'll see about the possibility of prosecution. Lawyers filed for Barack Obama's arrest. World's top war crimes attorney says he will get George W. Bush and huge secret wars you're paying for that you don't even know about. Washington's putting intense and persistent pressure to overturn war crime sentences of other countries' commanders, reveals a top judge at The Hague. Judge Frederick Harhoff says the White House is getting extremely nervous about its own crimes. The court said commanders were responsible for war crimes their subordinates committed. But the chamber suddenly backtracked. The US felt they were getting too close to their own commanders. The Malaysian court already found George W. Bush and his deputies guilty of torture and war crimes. At the trial, Mahathir Mohamed, Malaysia's ex-premier, heard from victims and witnesses and was blunt. These are basically murderers, and they kill on a large scale. The eight convicted were John Yu. Newsweek reports he advised Bush that whole villages can be legally, quote, massacred. The dean of Yale Law School called Jay Bybee's infamous torture memo the most erroneous legal opinion he has ever read. The National Lawyers Guild filed a complaint over William Haynes' recommendations for so-called stress positions and use of dogs against prisoners. Newsweek notes Richard Cheney's lawyer, David Addington, penned the key memorandum that the Geneva Convention doesn't apply to them. Alberto Gonzalez wrote that the laws against torture are, quote, obsolete and quaint. The Senate Armed Services Committee reports Donald Rumsfeld approved the, quote, aggressive techniques used in Guantanamo and black sites around the world. Richard Cheney told the Washington Times he, quote, signed off on the so-called enhanced interrogations. I don't care what the international lawyers say, we're gonna kick some <laughs> said Bush, notes counterterrorism head Richard Clark. The world's leading war crimes lawyer was on that prosecution team. Francis Boyle sent President Milosevic to The Hague in 2001. He was the first to bring an Israeli general to court for atrocities against Palestinians. Now his lawsuits around the world against Bush are cornering him, stopping him from travel. Professor Boyle, thanks a lot for joining us. Will you get Bush and co, even if they stay at home? Bush and the rest of them have been advised by their attorneys not to be traveling around the world. We're, we're going to get them here too. They killed about 1.5 million Iraqis. As for U.S. service personnel, uh, Bush and the rest of them murdered about 5,000. Uh, so it, that's why I think it, it's going to take longer because the uh, offenses uh, were so grave and so extreme compared to Milosevic. What's people's reaction to you closing in on him? I think they'll be rejoicing in the streets uh, when, when they're brought to justice here in America and, and perhaps in, in other places in the world as well, certainly uh, Iraq for what, what they did in Iraq. There's no question about that. I'm, I'm sure there'll be parades over there uh, in Iraq when Bush and Cheney uh, are brought to justice. George W. Bush had to cancel his first trip following the admission in autobiography Decision Points that he ordered waterboarding. He shied away from Switzerland after Swiss MPs worked on a warrant for his arrest with New York's Center for Constitutional Rights. 
CCR senior attorney Catherine Gallagher joins us. Thanks a lot for coming on. Now, the current response is old Bush has contacts, no one can touch him, but you work with lawmakers around the globe. Why is he now cautious of traveling anywhere? The globe is covering this convention against torture. So most of the globe is obligation to investigate and, and punish George Bush. Actually, the Obama team uh, reached out to Switzerland and sought assurances that George Bush wouldn't be prosecuted and that the Swiss response was, we have an independent prosecutor prosecutor and an independent judiciary, we can make that uh, promise to you. Cowboy Republic, the six ways the Bush gang has defied the law, lists 200 pages of White House crimes. The author of that book is former head of the National Lawyers Guild, Marjorie Cohen. Thanks very much for joining us. What are the six ways the Bush gang defied the law? Okay, Daniel, and I just want to say, first of all, that there are many more than six ways, but I had to limit it. Um, so that's why I, I only chose six, or the book would be as long as an encyclopedia. Um, the first, and I think in some ways the most serious, uh, is the illegal wars in Iraq and Afghanistan. This is a crime of aggression. Crime of aggression at Nuremberg was to be the supreme international crime. So then the second uh, violation of the law is the torture regime that was set up by Bush officials and their legal mercenaries, John Yu, J. Bybee, and other lawyers. Third violation is war crimes, that, and torture is considered a war crime as well, but the killing of civilians, the targeting of civilians, two of the most notorious instances of war crimes, um, the Haditha massacre, where um, U.S. Marines basically executed about 24 men, women, and children in cold blood. Um, it was just horrific um, at, uh, at, at Haditha. And then the Fallujah massacre, um, which was done in retaliation for the killing of four Blackwater mercenaries, um, was a civilians were targeted. Um, U.S. soldiers went house to house and took them out and shot them. Um, they shot families crossing the river. Helicopters and snipers shot people. Um, there were uh, unknown numbers, hundreds of people that were killed in Fallujah. God bless America! Yeah. Then the fourth um, violation of the law is the prison camp that the United States maintains at Guantanamo. Um, then the fifth example of lawbreaking by the Bush administration was the illegal spying program, surveillance program, spying on Americans' conversations, and then a data mining program, very much like we've heard about lately from Edward Snowden. And then finally, um, the refusal to uh, fulfill the law. When Congress would pass a law, frequent George W. Bush would sign the law and then attach what we call a signing statement saying, yes, I'm signing this law, but I am only going to follow the parts of it that I agree with. And, uh, and the president cannot make the law under the U.S. Constitution. That's up to Congress. <laughs> Tomorrow, when Obama lands in South Africa, lawyers have filed for his arrest for genocide. The country that went through apartheid to attack on ethnic groups classed as inferior charges the Obama administration's now doing the exact same thing. Indiscriminate confinement of Muslims without charge and targeted drone attacks on Muslim civilian populations around the globe. A charge worse than apartheid, in fact, constitutes genocide. The Muslim Lawyers Association brought the claim to prosecutors with attorney Yusha Tayyab. He joins us. It's great to have you on. Obama now expanding the war on terror to a war on whistleblowers and using drones over US soil. You note, as with apartheid, discrimination is spiraling out of control. It's a history that our people know. And so it's something we can identify with. And that is particularly pertinent to the South African community because, as you know, pre-94, we had extensive detention without trial in this country. And the comparative to the South African public is, you didn't condone it then. Why must you allow it to happen on an international basis now? And so this is a genocide, a, a torture, a, a perpetuated campaign against people of the Muslim faith. One of the judges in a Pakistani high court judgment that we've attached to our complaint uh, has declared the drone attacks to be illegal uh, and has asked the UN to investigate it. He seems to want to joke about the drone attacks. He's recorded as having said at one of his balls held in the US that if any person's had designs on his daughters, he's got predator drones. But uh, boys don't get any ideas. 
I have two words for you. Predator drones. <laughs> you will never see it coming. <laughs> you think I'm joking? At last week's G8 in Ireland, MP Claire Daly says corporate media should stop pretending Obama's anything but a war criminal. By any serious examination, this man is a war criminal. He has just announced his decision to supply arms to the Syrian opposition, including the jihadists, fueling the destabilization of that region and continuing to undermine secularism and knock back conditions for women. And to hell with the thousands more who le lose their lives or the tens of thousands more who will be displaced as this war goes on. This is the man who has facilitated a 200% increase in the use of drones which have killed thousands of people, including hundreds of children. Transparency and the rule of law will be the touchstones of this presidency. His administration, the Washington Post says, has in fact been the most secretive since Nixon, classifying 92 million documents a year. That's even more than Bush. Former intelligence officer Scott Rickard is investigating secret disastrous wars American people are waging in their name and funding and don't even know about. Thanks a lot for joining us. Tell us about those wars and why have they been a disaster? What people don't realize is that there's been a war for four years. They fought a war down through Sudan and Ethiopia and into Somalia. And then they tell us in the news that there's been a, a terrible drought and 250,000 people have died. When in fact, what had happened is that all the food supply and all the water supply was basically wiped out. And so they're left to die in the desert because now they're going and developing the oil fields in this new country created South Sudan. And, uh, and then when it comes to... Uh, to war crimes using uh, mess weapons of mass destruction. I mean, the depleted uranium lined Hellfire missiles, and this is a fact. Uh, they're fired from Predator and Reaper drones. They deliver at least 10 kilograms of depleted uranium, which permanently contaminates the target areas. So when you go back in there, you're guaranteed, if you spend too much time, to get some form of, uh, of, of horrific cancer that will kill you between uh, 10 and 15 years. That's how poisonous this stuff is. And we've got a lot of our soldiers around this stuff that are dying, but they don't talk a lot about it. It's like, the, it's like, it's like our generation's Agent Orange. I call him Obama the odious. Then you've also got these secret kill lists by Obama. You've got the legal wars in Libya and elsewhere. You've got, uh, uh, he started the covert war in, uh, in Yemen and, and basically deposed another uh, leader in that country. Uh, you've got uh, um, enormous mercenary presence in Iraq. Sitting presidents are harder to stop. Lawyers say they may have to wait till Obama steps down. Bush and his officials are effectively prisoners in their own country, fearful of arrest if they travel abroad. For the victims of their crimes, that's not punishment enough. This is The Truth Seeker. Okay, uh, boy, I'll tell you, isn't it amazing how you have to go to Russia today or some other foreign press to get any sort of decent news? The crap that we show on NBC, CBS, N MSNBC, uh, go down the whole alphabet list, CNN, they're all guilty of the same thing, non-news. They're now entertainment. Just remember that when you watch them. They're entertainment only. Nothing to do with telling you truth or news. It's everything to do with controlling your opinion, though. So, I mean, it's just amazing. And the last bit there about the depleted uranium, I mean, that's so serious, it's shocking that it's, uh, that it's silent. I mean, it's so, so serious. I mean, wars come and go, political differences come and go, but depleted uranium is forever. And every place we've used it is n now off limits to human beings or they die. And of course, all over, Iraq, your tremendous birth defects and cancer deaths, and you know, what on earth did a civilian population ever do to deserve that? I mean, even if you could argue that somehow the government of a country deserves it, the civilians sure don't. We can't keep using war as an option on the table for resolving differences. It can no longer be tolerated by any civilized society. Well, time to talk about 9-11.
take a deep breath there, get back to something that's not quite as not quite as interesting, right? No, 9-11 is, is where this coup d'etat started. It was a coup d'etat without a doubt. Took over the entire government. The, um, but let me show you what I got this weekend when I filmed the uh, uh, Richard Gage and Ken Jenkins presentation. And this is that 9-11 uh, t-shirt. I thought that 9-11 side should be on the front, you know, but here. 9-11, explosive evidence. So we're starting a new campaign. It's called Rethink 9-11. And um, all over New York, they're putting up 50-foot-tall billboards, Rethink 9-11. I'm going to play you uh, about a three-minute clip here that will kind of tell you about the Rethink 9-11 campaign. So if you guys are ready. Did you know a third tower fell on 9-11? At approximately 5.20 p.m. on September 11, 2001, World Trade Center Building 7 collapsed in 6.5 seconds due to normal office fires, according to the government reports. World Trade Center 7 collapsed because of fires fueled by office furnishings. It did not collapse from explosives or from fuel oil fires. In 2008, the government admitted that World Trade Center 7 collapsed at free fall for over 100 feet. This admission brings with it some serious implications that have yet to be addressed. If this sounds a bit odd to you, you're not alone. Polls show that 30% of U.S. citizens still have questions about the official 9-11 hypothesis. Rethink 9-11 is a rapidly growing coalition of more than 50 organizations from around the world including well-respected organizations of scientists, technical experts, peace activists, religious persons, veterans, and surviving family members of 9-11 victims. All of these groups. Okay, we're back. It was kind of a sudden thing. Uh, I have with me Marcella Pena, and she and I both went to, oh, can you get us on the other camera? They, they will eventually. Oh, put the other back. Oh, they'll figure it out. Anyway, I'm trying to direct from the... Uh, from the pulpit, as it were. Anyway, um, we're going to open up the phone lines now, 503-288-4448. And uh, if you want to talk about anything that we've showed today or talked about, or bring up your own subject, as long as it's kind of, well, with a title like State Crimes Against Democracy, virtually any subject works. <laughs> well. It, this weekend, what I like the most, I mean, I've heard Richard Gage a lot. A lot of people haven't, and it was an excellent presentation. It was what happened on 9-11 and why does it matter? And uh, the thing I liked was when Ken Jenkins was explaining, you know, so people ask the question all the time, why would they allow the towers, to, why would they have to collapse the towers? Why not just run the terrorist hijacker planes right into it, and that's good enough to scare everybody? But it turns out that, according to Ken Jenkins, the psychology would have been totally backwards. If the, pl if the building still stood after the plane hit, our unconscious psychology would have said, oh, America is strong enough, we can take attacks, and w this building stood, everything is okay, we'll just fix the damage and go after them, or something like that. But not fear. And the whole point of 9-11 was to create fear in your mind, so that you could have the Patriot Act and the NDAA and w endless wars against nothing in particular except terror. Yeah, terror. We're going to fight against terror. Oh, there's terror. <coughs> oh, wait a minute. That was my neighbor. Sorry. <laughs> well, anyway, I'm just being kind of facetious here. But you either, you either ha develop a sense of humor or you just eat yourself up with this, you know, worry and, and hate for what's going on. Uh, yeah, yeah, very, um, yes, and so to be proactive with your energy, if, if um, especially if today's show has moved you, which I hope it has, because uh, Bill's been showing some pretty great uh, video clips. I'm not sure if you got to see the entire of the last video, but that was an outstanding video as well. But, well, but, um, but yeah, the video, the last video was on Rethink, uh, well, it's Architect and Engineer, Oh, sorry, the organization Architect and Engineers for 9-11 Truth. Um, yeah, just had a major presentation <laughs> this past weekend. And their latest campaign is 9-11, is Rethink 9-11. And um, please go to rethink911.org 
and see how you could be supportive, how you can contribute to the effort. Um, they are focusing primarily in 11, 11 cities. The closest city to us is Vancouver, BC, which is unfortunate that it wasn't, you know, San Francisco, Seattle, Portland, or, or, but. Yeah, it would have been so, nice. What they're doing is putting up really big billboards. Yeah, rethink in 11 cities, you know? yeah, New York City, of course, being one of them, you know, one of the important ones. Uh, yeah, they're important. Yeah, so, but, but it is 11 <laughs> cities throughout, you know, and it is, you know, if they'd had, you know, more funds, they, you know, it would have been more cities, you know, Portland, I'm sure would have been included, but right now it is a focus. <laughs> focus on 11 cities, well, a major focus on 11 cities, but also, you know, local groups throughout the country are trying to do their push as well. And this is an effort for this, this year's September 11, uh, September, uh, the, the, the anniversary. The 9-11 anniversary. Yes. By the way, I have an announcement about that. Uh, if you take a look at the calendar, you'll see that, what is it, a Wednesday or something. It's in the middle of the week, I'm not sure. So my... My next show, I mean, the, sh the nearest show to that would have been like the Saturday afterwards. But I traded with another producer who had other oh, time nice. constraints with the show just before it. So coming up on 9-11, I That's will fantastic. have the Saturday before and the Saturday after. Both of them will be live shows. And we'll try to cover, you know, what leads up to the anniversary. And then after the anniversary, we'll cover, you know, how maybe the public took it. And we'll just see how that goes. Um, yeah, but remember, please, to go to Rethink911.org. Uh, and any contribution you make, it's a 501c3. Yes, it's a 501c3, and see what you can do maybe locally in your city um, if you feel so engaged. But please, if you want to be proactive, this is really a website to go to in the here and now um, because the campaign is, you know, is right now, and it's, you know, where September is our, you know, is what we're pushing towards. It's funny. So, they, they, they warn you about not asking for money on cable access, but... If it's a 501c3, apparently you can. Uh, oh, nice. For, for instance, take a look at anything. Anytime you see uh, Democracy Now! with Amy Goodman, they're always doing these money That's marathons true. or whatever you call them, telethons. And uh, they keep broadcasting it on cable access, so it must be okay. Yeah. Now, the 501c3 is uh, uh, a nonprofit organization, and, and apparently we can talk about what their actions are. Yeah, so, so um, again, just a couple websites. Uh, the website for Architects and Engineers for 9-11 for Truth is ae911.org. AE, I'm sorry, ae911truth.org. Jeez, ae911truth.org. And then for this campaign, for the the campaign that urges people to realize that three skyscrapers Three skyscrapers fell in New York City on the day of 9-11. Um, that is the Rethink 9-11 campaign, rethink911.org. And we think that Building 7 is the key to people's understanding because, after all, no plane hit it. And by the government's own admission, the damage to the building was not substantial in itself. Um, they're blaming the entire thing on office fires. And we've had over 100 years of steel frame buildings <coughs> that have withstood the test of fire and all of a sudden three buildings on one weekend succumb to fire nonsense anyway we think that that's the, the Achilles heel to you know getting something to happen apparently uh, we've had a lot of foreign dignitaries foreign uh, politicians and officers of state claim that 9-11 was an inside job and they demand like we do a new investigation yes yeah, and this was my third time seeing Richard Gage as well because we had, um, I, oh, I, I'm i the co-founder of the Portland chapter of Architects and Engineers for 9-11 Truth. It was co-founded in 2011, so not that long ago really, ten year, at the 10-year anniversary. <coughs> and um, yeah, and I was, and I got I got a chance to hear some things I'd never, some facts I'd never, I maybe, I, I don't feel like I'd heard before. Um, what and I that like was the really best, kind of it, great. It's, it, it really gets to people, you know, you, Richard Gage started out by having some cardboard boxes made up to imitate the bottom part of the, of the building, like the towers, and a littler box here, and he drops it on that and drops another box here, which hits the ground first. Well, okay, that's interesting, but it doesn't really tell you very much. It doesn't get to you. Um, and he started using a different way of doing it. I love this. He, he shows you a semi-truck and trailer and a Volkswagen, and he says, if they hit, who wins? Well, you know it's not the Volkswagen. Okay, and he says, does it make a difference if you put it vertically, the Volkswagen up here, drop it on the truck? No, it doesn't. The Volkswagen still loses. 
So why did the Volkswagen win on 9-11? Yeah, and, and specifically, great... yeah, and specifically, we're we're talking about how you know how how the towers you know take the north or the south tower, how um, how uh, uh, you know a plane hit it at a, at a certain oh, we have a caller by the way oh. a, a plane hit you know at the tower at a certain height and so the top part was was said to Oscillate. to be compromised and to somehow have pushed the rest down. Oh yeah, and you know and and you can't the do that because, because really w w when you take slow motion the what happened to the tops of those buildings. You know, like basically the top being what was above the plane impact, Th the top of those buildings were actually experienced experienced explosions themselves and totally disintegrated before before the rest of the building even fell. Bef so if, if you take it slow yeah, motion, you see that, which is you know really kind of stunning. Um, but 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 that's what he was talking about. How you know a, a smaller something can't crush a larger something, <laughs> and you know, it just goes against physics. Yeah. So but okay, caller, please yes. caller. So, Caller, if you're on the line, please come through. Need a little more volume in here. Yeah. I, had, I turned it down too much, probably. We can. I can hear you in the way distance. Hello, can you hear me? No, I, 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 you're in the way distance. Just, hold on a second, There's just a little technical difficulty. You're, you're coming through more. There we go. Uh, better? Better. Still not great, but better. Silver would seem to have to go to court for the asbestos um, issues. That, so I think that's one reason why they wanted them destroyed also. And then wasn't all the Enron documents for the court case in in Tower 7? Absolutely. Yeah. Yes, yes, uh, yes. Um, is, that, is that true? Have you guys heard that? Yeah. Um, yes, uh, well, Bill saying Absolutely yes. Absolutely true. And, and I'll actually add something to that. Uh, well, two things. Oh, gosh, what was your first so point was something. Oh, my God, your first point like was... Like oh, man. Um, well, you, I, I wanted to say two things. I, I just totally lost on the first point. But the second point I wanted to say, um, since you brought up the documentation, um, you know how the Pentagon was hit? Uh, I believe the day before 9-11 happened, uh, the Pentagon announced that $2.3 trillion were lost uh, because of the Pentagon. $2.3 trillion. Um, that would be enough to, to uh, correct all, all bridges, all, all important infrastructure in the U.S., that's what it would take. But $2.3 trillion was lost the day before 9-11 happened. And uh, the, the area of pen the Pentagon that was hit was the area, was the auditing area. That was where um, and, yeah. and it was actually, that area was actually, re had just been recently reinforced. It was actually impenetrable. So how did a yeah. plane hit? I don't understand that. But you're but, but absolutely well, right. All the cameras weren't working at the time. Or, the or they were confiscated, outside, actually. Burnt. They were... <laughs> Where's the wreckage from the plane? Yes. I oh, yeah. could go on and on. I really, have, I just found your show oh. for the first time. Oh, cool. Um, thank you. Thank yeah. you so much for having it. I'm going to look up the new website, and I just wanted yeah. to, I think things like that are important for people to know. Yes. There yeah. was a lot yes. of reasons. Yes. Besides, yeah, and it's important know, for people to know that, that there are organizations out there. the world. Yes, and, yeah. and just know that there are organizations out there. We're, we're, we're trying to do something about it, you know, so please try and go to Rethink. Uh, 911.org. You know, be proactive with your energy. Don't try and stuff it in and get all angry. Um, you know, be, oh. be, be proactive and <laughs> I, be good I with it. I got angry in, in the 60s with Kennedy, and I've been angry. Yeah. I just now I'm <laughs> kind of go. Sometimes they yeah. amaze me. Yeah, they no, amaze yeah. me at their brazenness, and and yeah. they're really good at at faking out the whole world. Yeah, that. But with the no news, I mean, everybody believes Rush Limbaugh and uh, <laughs> whoever, you know. <laughs> you know the Kennedy thing; it's a state crime against democracy too. So we can talk about that yeah. a little bit. But did you know that there was a uh, deathbed confession? E. Howard Hunt confessed to being the uh, head of the group that assassinated the president, and he told a lot more. And uh, oh. Je Jesse Ventura even had that on his show, and. Not a mention in any other media, let alone investigate to see if it could possibly be true. But there are documents and videos of the deathbed confession, which is supposedly uh, evidence in court. <coughs> but ma'am, what was I didn't your know if we'd ever see anything in my lifetime, but I guess we. But that's a fantastic point. But ma'am, what was your very first point? Because I, I, I wanted to answer it, but I had forgotten it. If you remember. Well, she. She already left. She must be okay. gone. Anyway, she okay. said something about uh, Enron. 
the information that they were using to prosecute Enron was okay, in okay, Building yeah, 7. Okay, yeah, yeah. And I said and, about the Pentagon about and that. Building 7 was also the largest CIA office yes. outside of Langley. Yes. So those, for those reasons, I mean, the SEC, the Security Exchange Commission, stored its uh, evidence of their ongoing prosecutions, of which there were over 100 prosecutions similar to Enron, and all that evidence just poof, gone. You know, what a coincidence. Just, just another unintended coincidence? I think not. Well, we have a caller. If you would like to come through, please come through, caller. Caller? Uh, there you are. Can you hear me now? Yes. yes. Okay. Um, I'm getting kind of an echo back to me, but it's you guys. Oh, okay. turn down your TV in the background. It's completely muted. Oh, okay. <laughs> That's us then. <laughs> Sorry. Yeah, I, the, maybe the game turned up. No, it, I, I have the thing misadjusted right now. Uh, anyway, real quickly, um, we do have a spy plane that flies over every day and in nighttime. And I confirmed to my neighbor, the private instructor, because he thought the pilot Whoa. had a stroke because it was just flying around in circles. This was a couple summers ago. And he called AA, and he finally got the person that he, he said it was a law enforcement. I said, find out which branch That's of law enforcement was. He said, no, he didn't ask. But um, anyway, uh, it flies over almost every day. It's flying at a very slow speed. It's kind of like a, uh, similar to a Cessna, it's a high wing plane. And most of the time, the one that they fly has uh, blue stripes on the wing tips at the end. At the end, it's kind of an off-white colored plane. And they use two or three different planes. But I first discovered this about four years ago. But another person I met on the street one night up in Multnomah Village, I pointed the plane out to him, and I said, it's been flying around now for uh, several, four years. And he says, no, six years. And wow. I said, how do you know? And he says, my old man's a retired full bird colonel in the Air Force. So this guy knew the inside information. Then on top of that, I would like to find out if there's a phone number, because I'm not an Internet person. Yeah. Is there a phone number to call? Act AE 911truth.org. Do they have some kind of a phone number, whether it's an 800 or a standard number? Not that I can I call know. them, order some uh, hats, t shirts, and videos. Um, you know what? I don't know. No, he's uh, looking I was at my shirt. To see. Yeah, I, oh my gosh. And I don't have my cell phone on me to quickly. If, if you could, oh, and you don't have a. What, who are, what are you thinking about? You don't well, really have an 800 number to yeah, call. Yeah. Well, well, it wouldn't be an 800 number if they just had a standard, you know, uh, you know a regular toll number that would call. Uh, where is he based out of? Is it uh, uh, East Coast? San Francisco. Huh? Um, Oakland, California, I believe. Oakland, o Oakland oh, California. I, I thought it was San Francisco, but it's Oakland. Okay. Um, He's been an architect. I don't have, I'm part of the 36% of the demographic that are not connected to the Internet. I heard that on the news. About <laughs> By the way, you can come down to Portland Community Media and use their computers here. You know, it's that's a long trip for me and my car is broke down right now. But uh, oh. well, find your nearest yeah. library. <laughs> yeah, find your nearest library. Find your nearest library. Yeah. The other thing I was going to say real quickly is that the uh, I called in about probably five years ago when you first started the show to let you know I'm a retired firefighter and the National Fire Protection Association, the NFPA, uh, go to their website. I haven't been to their website, but I'm sure it's on there. But there's two high-rise fires that we had to study, which was one was down in San Paulo, Brazil, in like approximately 1986. Right. Yeah. The other one was in uh, the first interstate bank building, what is now the Wells Fargo building in Los Angeles in 1988. And I may have the two years transposed. One was in 86, one was in 88. It doesn't matter. These are both 80-plus story tall buildings. And the one in Brazil burned for 36 hours. The one in Los Angeles burned for 48 hours. And I saw the uh, the movie footage or the video footage that the local news copter down there took from their with their telephoto lens, and both floors. Uh, this fire occurred on like about the 60th floor or something like that, the 60th, 61st floors, and it looked like a kiln, like a where you fire pottery in. It was just glowing oh, red hot. I mean, it had been burning that long where it had basically, you know, it wasn't even hardly producing any smoke anymore. It was just glowing red in there. So that was hot enough to. Uh, weaken the steel, you would think. Yeah, ninety percent uh, or something. They say. What's that? They they say when they're glowing red, it, they can lose fifty to ninety percent of their strength. But yeah, well, that building but the overrating is five times, so it doesn't matter. Yeah, and when I looked at that thing <sighs> back, I was working that day when the uh, towers collapsed, and be well before the towers collapsed, I looked at that and I went, well, 
I think what's going to happen, if anything happens, is the top part of that building is going to collapse to one side. It's going to like lean over, kind of like the Leaning Tower pizza, One of them did. And it may fall over and fall on the ground. But when I saw the rest of that just <laughs> down pulverized, I looked at that because I worked in heavy construction for six years, mostly around concrete and steel type of uh, uh, workings, and especially the last two years before I got into the fire service in 1978. And... Uh, I know how much steel is put in there. I know that the concrete has to be tested. And it's the, the, the concrete that they put in those buildings, I mean, just even in one of the local hospitals that I worked on, the, um, the PSI, the concrete in there was like 6,500 PSI strength steel, or uh, strength concrete, I think. So it takes that much to break like it up, right? You know, and then for the average driveway, they're only 3,500 pound mix, and in a... In a uh, commercial building like that, it's got to be 4,500 to 5,500 uh, psi mix. That means that once that concrete's cured, uh, after uh, like approximately 28, 30 days, they put it, uh, a chunk of that stuff into a uh, uh, like a press, a hydraulic press, yeah. and it has to withstand uh, 5,500 psi uh, pounds per square inch. So uh, I knew something was rotten in Denmark when I Absolutely. saw it. Absolutely, basically turned to dust. You I don't get that type of pressure here. from a collapse. Yeah, but uh, anyway, oh, this uh, guy just showed me a video the other day on his smartphone of the Reagan assassination attempt. Yeah. yeah. And he pointed out to me <laughs> yeah. that um, he said, look at this uh, apartment right up above. There's an apartment window or a condo window right up above. And just moments before Reagan's, you know, keeling over from the pain of being shot, he points out that he says, you see up here in the window, there's like kind of like a gauzy type of a curtain in the window. It's a full-length window, probably like a sliding glass window. And that window is partially, I guess it was a sliding glass door. And that window, that door is, is about open, about, uh, about four inches, four to six inches. And you can see the bottom part of it. These were all still frame photos, I guess, that were taken back in. But this guy had them on his smartphone. And... Um, this guy was a professional I was talking to. I won't mention what kind of a job that he used to do, but he's retired now. But he said, see that? And then it shows Reagan healing over in pain, and then in the next frame, that window, the curtain's completely drawn, and you don't see anybody behind the, the curtain anymore. Ah, interesting. And so that he claims that Reagan was shot from up above in this condo, which was like a second-story condo uh, uh, landing, or like a lanai or a, a balcony type oh. of thing. We only have about a minute left. Anyway, hey, thank you for all the good work you do. And maybe, hey, uh, tell the guy to put me on hold, and if you guys got a phone number there, I'll wait off air, and I'll uh, get that phone number so I can order that stuff from those guys. Thank you very much, sir. Thank you for saying that. Right and on. I want to get some videos, hats, T-shirts, and whatever else they got. Okay. Thank you, sir. Thank I missed you. The, the, uh, the presentation they had up there a week ago or whenever it was I wanted to go, but I just didn't have time to do it. Well, so I'm going to put that on so you'll see that on TV. really good stuff. Yeah, we'll we'll have that up um, and viewable for people to see who weren't able to make it. Okay, now our next show is the first Saturday of next month, um, and we'll try to bring you some clips of the uh, of the presentation. I wasn't able to do that today, but uh, I will get them put on to. Uh, Ooh, we have a caller. I guess we have another caller. Well, we got 50 seconds. We'll try to take this other call, but uh, I'll go ahead and try to get my uh, video posted on cable access here. Uh, caller, if you like, uh, if you like to come through. Yeah, am I on air? You yeah, got forty you, seconds. You, yeah, you have about yeah, forty I, seconds. I just had a comment. Um, I don't want anybody who uh, watches your show or to come under the idea that Al Qaeda doesn't exist. They do. They're very active, and they're oh, at war with us. They're and we, well, no, they're not. Man, they are. At war they with are. Us, and you they are. Obama use. is the leader of Al Qaeda. You have to understand it, that. So don't there, don't tell me that Al Qaeda is Al Qaeda is paid for by the United States. Not, so just get that they're, right. Sir, they're not hard to find. I mean, Omar. Well, Hamani no, but is we're using Twitter them in, in Syria we, we, to we disrupt everything. We realize they exist, so that's not. That's well, not, we got to go. Omar, Omar Hamani is on Twitter. For